Femi Lara here again. This is so great to have these weekly sessions on the Mapex Facebook page, which allows me to bring in different people, talk about drumming, open up the channel to any questions and people that join us in this year. And today we had scheduled Kurt Covington. Well, Kurt ended up getting a last minute session. And when an artist gets a session, I want that to take priority. So I'm glad that he was able to take it. We will reschedule Kurt for sure. I call him Captain Kirk. He's so fantastic. Aside as a drummer, a singer, a piano player, he's really multifaceted. We'll get more into Kirk later on. But right now, I've asked to fill in Mark Bennett. Mark, thank you so much for joining us. This is fantastic. Dom, thank you so much for having me. I'm so glad uh, I was able to step in for Kirk. Um, hope he's having fun today and makes fantastic music. Uh, we'll, uh, we'll do our best here. Absolutely. Well, you know, I, the reason why I wanted to have you, Mark, I know this was last minute when I said, Mark, I want to have you on is because you're really the A&R person for Mapex and also sales and support manager. So your responsibility yes. with the company is so important that I want people to understand what you did and kind of how you came into all of this year. We already have some people logging on here, which is so fantastic. So I want you to talk about your early stages of what got you involved in music and when you started getting involved with, you know, orchestral percussion and then also drum corps percussion, right? Yeah. Talk yeah. about the uh, early days. Uh, I mean, drumming for me started on pots and pans when I was a little kid. I mean, my mom's yeah. got plenty of stories of me bought, you know, wooden spoons and banging on all the pots. Um, but I started taking music serious in fifth grade. Um, I got into a beginning band. And for some reason, I was they, they let me in as just a drummer. Uh, everybody else had to play a different instrument first, but they needed drummers. So they gave me a test, and I, I ended up uh, playing concert snare and, you know, learning all the rudiments and starting a beginning band, um, and then and just kind of went from there. You were living where at this time? I'm from Northern California, so San Jose, California. So a beautiful area up there, by the way, too. So you were playing in the school band. You got involved with the school program. Yep. Uh, started in middle school, um, played concert band. And in my middle school, we actually had a drum set. So there was a jazz band program. But I mean, as a fifth, sixth grader, uh, just starting, it wasn't, you know, uh, advanced by any means. It was uh, as straightforward as it could possibly be. Uh, but when I got to high school, we actually didn't have a drum set. And in high school, I actually got into marching band. And that's when everything took a real big turn for me uh, as a percussionist. You know, having concert band in, in school, and have, as, as I was also in school, I was involved with the concert band, I was involved with the jazz band, I was also involved in marching band. It was such an important thing, and some of the school programs are really being ripped away. The music programs are just being destroyed. How important was the school music program for you growing up? I tell you what, I would definitely not be where I'm at today if I didn't have music. Mm -hmm. uh, music really kept me out of trouble and gave me something to do, gave me an outlet. Um, you know, uh, give me a way to, um, to just outlet, just, just a, a place to put my energy that was for the good. Yeah. Yeah. This is, it's really, it's so important. I mean, I don't know how we can do it, but I don't want to lose the school music programs. Every person that I've interviewed in all the different interviews that I've done, both from Apex and also for the sessions panel that I've done, I would have to probably say over 90% of them speak about how important it is to have a school music program and how that opened up so many doors for them. It's, um, well, you know, the, the marching band program at my high school, actually, I was really fortunate. Um, our instructors um, were actually members of Santa Clara Vanguard uh, Drum and Bugle Corps. And so we were kind of, uh, you know, while it was still high school marching band, we were kind of being trained by members to kind of feed in to the drum corps program. So that whole thing, um, you know, while we were a really tiny band and we were a really underfunded band, yeah. um, we had some phenomenal people standing in front of us giving some incredible feedback. So while our equipment wasn't the best and we didn't always have, you know, the biggest drum lines, uh, we were receiving some fantastic info and, uh, and, Got some really good training that actually helped a lot of us actually move on to marks with Santa Clara Vanguard and Blue Devils and, and Sacramento Mandarins from high school. So um, really important. So that that preparation in, in, in your school music program really kind of prepared you for the for, for, for Santa Clara Vanguards, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, 
Like I said, all of our staff were either current members or instructors with the Vanguard organization. Um, uh, and then um, as we actually got into marching drum corps um, and actually graduated, a lot of us actually went back to our local schools and started teaching um, at the local high schools in the area and kind of continued that thing of, of you know, working with kids to bring them up in the activity to, to, you know, to participate. Well, I want to get into teaching a little later because you know, that, that's a very important part of continuing the cycle of being able to prepare the next generation, which is what you have done. So talk about this here. Talk about the fact that with the orchestral percussion, which is sometimes a, 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 you know, n you know, negligent in how we see things, how important was orchestral percussion for you when you were involved in school? I wish I got. I wish I took it a little bit more seriously. To be honest, my mo my, my main focus was was uh, marching side, the rudimental side. I really wanted to march drum corps, so I spent almost all my time dedicated to you know learning rudiments. I was a quad player, so learning how to get around the drums, scrapes, and and patterns and stuff like that. Um, I probably should have spent a little bit more time working on scales and, and <laughs> I mainly played uh, concert snare drum. Um, I jumped in on some timpani pieces here and there, um, but I never really got into the mallet thing. And I, I, I now, if I had an opportunity to go back to me as a, a kid in high school, <laughs> I said, learn your scales, you know, learn, learn four mallets, learn, you know, as much as you can. And uh, it'll definitely help you out in the future. And that's that's one thing I definitely missed the boat on, that I, I, if I had the opportunity to go back, I'd do it different. Well, this is so great. And I want people that are joining us to ask any questions to Mark, because Mark is filling in again for Kurt, Kirk Covington, who had a session today. And he's off and running in the studios right now. So Mark has decided to fill in. And Mark is the A&R, you know, artist relations person for Mapex, and also in sales and, and support manager for the product. So he knows a lot about the product and what's happening. So people that are joining on, and we already have people. Artemy Kor is from Moscow, who's a phenomenal student, who also, his wife and he both play drums, and they take lessons with me in a master class I do with Maxim Dioman, which is a fantastic class every week that we do. Diego Sanchez has joined us. Simon Bijaring has joined us. Another phenomenal player upstate New York, who's originally from Denmark. Carlos Gutschman, a phenomenal drummer, who's joining us from, from Miami. And Carlos is another drum tech. And we're going to get into this whole drum tech thing that you did with not only uh, Barry Kurt, but, of course, with Ray Luzier. So we'll get into that in a second. Sure. But uh, Randy Davis is from Indiana. I mean, this is so great to have these people, you know, joining us. And Thanks so much. Any anybody that has questions, put them in the comment section, and we'll, uh, we'll, we'll bring those questions up. So with this now, you get involved with, with marching band. So were you taking lessons with anybody? How were you getting your chops together? Um, I was. I was, you know, besides our regular drum line rehearsals, I was taking private lessons um, with uh, with our drum instructor, who was a, a member of the Vanguard uh, tenor line. He marched uh, 1996, 97, and 98. Um, and it, oddly enough, he was, the way it worked out, he was my drum instructor my entire marching career. Uh, he taught my high school, and then when I got into drum corps, he had aged out and was offered an opportunity to come work with the drum corps, and he ended up being my tenor tech all my three years on the Santa Clara Vanguard. Um, so uh, I always had the same guy standing in front of me uh, my entire career growing up. But yeah, I, I studied with a gentleman named Jeremy Van Wert, um, who is still involved with the organization now. Um, but yeah, that was, that was my drum instructor. I took private lessons from him. And it was really funny when I was in high school, he was a drum set player. He was really into Rush. And he was the one who um, first exposed me to Rush. I had no idea who they were. <laughs> I'll never forget, we went to go sit down and he went to go teach me, you know, just basic drum set 101. And for me at the time, I didn't, I, I, again, I was so focused on the marching world. I, I didn't want to open up, listen, or put any effort into drum set. And I'll never forget how difficult it was for me to wrap my head around, you know, all four limbs. And, you know, yeah. I just wanted to play rolls and flan drags and you know, <laughs> How do, you do this on the toms. And, you know, there was nothing practical about my approach to playing drum set. So I never really dove into it at all. Well, you know, again, stepping into the world of Neil Peart, you know, you know, rest in peace. I mean, what a phenomenal professor he was on the instrument. And uh, to start to step into his world, that's a little bit scary. It's a bit of a roller coaster ride for sure. So you go. So you, at the at the school, you get involved with Santa Clara Vanguard, right? Yep. 
What was that like? What were you learning? What were you, what was the practice schedule? What was some of the things you were working on for your chops? Um, so I ended up with the Vanguard cadets for three years, 99, 2000 and 2002. And, um, some of the most incredible concepts that I still apply to, to everything today. Um, I learned from that organization, um, you know, simple things like, you know, two handed attacks, uh, you know, a nice big legato stroke and letting the stick, um, letting the stick vibrate and breathe and, and cr help create your tone. Um, uh, polyrhythms, I mean, intense rudimental stuff. I mean, it goes on and on and on, um, you know, learning how to play with the Met dead on yeah. or in time, but in front of the metronome or slightly behind the metronome, because as you move around on the field, where you are in the field changes on how you play with the rest of the, you know, the rest of the group on the field. Sometimes you got to be anticipate a little bit, which doesn't mean rush. It just means start a little sooner. Yeah. Um, sometimes you got to lay back a little bit and let the sound from behind you catch up. So just learning those, those, uh, the understanding of, of time and how to play with time and, and how everything relates, you know, front to back, side to side, um, you know, and more and more and more. There's there's so much I learned, but that's, you know, some of the big stuff that I took away. Boy, that, re that really is important to understand. And for people that have never been a marching band, as I was in high school, marching, you know, you wear a uniform, you're on the field, you're doing the halftime show for the football game. And the halftime show, we had to rehearse because not only are you playing, but you're moving around the field in certain areas, then you have to know the, the football field as to the yardage that you have for the steps that you're taking and the turns that you have to make. So not only do you have to understand and remember your part that you're playing, but then you have to understand you know, what you're walking, what the steps are, and what part of the field you're on. And several times, our drum line would be in the front of the audience while the rest of the band was behind us. And you are so correct. The sound is bouncing off of the walls. It's, you don't know where it's coming from. So you really have to feel what you're playing to keep the energy of that full, you know, 200 piece marching band alive. Yep. Yep. And you're always making adjustments. It never, never stays. They're always, as you move forward, you slow down a little bit. As you move back, you speed up a little bit. And so, um, it, it, and it was something that, you know, you constantly work on. I mean, we would rehearse back then. We have, um, like a weekly sectional. We'd have two week, uh, two weekday rehearsals. Yeah. Um, we'd have weekend rehearsals. We'd have a camp, you know, once a month, you know, for three or four days uh, over the weekend. So we would rehearse all the time. And once, you know, we all got out of school and it was summertime, it would start, you know, nine to nine. So nine in the morning to nine at night, you just drum, play, march all day long. Boy, that's, that, that's some great stuff. You know, we got a question here from Simon Bijaring. Simon is a wonderful drummer who's taken some lessons with me, and he's just a phenomenal player and and just a great, great educator. He also plays a lot of orchestral percussion, and he sits in the pit and plays many pit shows, too, so he's a great reader. But he says there, did Mark have any favorite books during those years, and do you have anything that you're working on now? Is there anything that you had from years ago that they used to work with those skills of marching band? I still love Stick Control. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> stick Control and break that book down so many different ways. I mean, you know, do everything off a right hand lead, left hand lead, do it with your feet, split it between your right foot and your right hand, your left foot and your left hand. I mean, you can really do so much with that book. That stick control book is still one of my favorites. I still personally teach out of it when I'm working with younger kids. Yeah. Um, I love incorporating the hand foot aspect to it and you know, left foot, right hand, right foot, right hand, and taking those sticking exercises and, and moving them around all four limbs. So uh, I love stick control. That's still one of my go-tos. Funky Primer is another fantastic book. That was um, Charles Dowd, right? I Charles believe that. Yeah. Charles Dowd. Charles Dowd passed away a few years ago. Charles Dowd, who I had gotten to know, he actually took a couple of lessons with me, wrote the book, The Funky Primer. It's actually an excellent book. Charles was from, I think, either the, the Oregon area or the Seattle area. I think he was from Oregon. And um, a great, great teacher there at the University of Oregon. And he wrote a book, Funky Prime, but I haven't heard that in a few years, man. Great, great book. Yeah, that's a good one. And then there's, um, I'm drawing a blank on the name. Jeff Hamilton was talking about it. Um, uh, marching book. Um, and uh, God, I can't, I'm drawing a blank on the name, but it's another one of my favorite. There was, it might've been the Wilcoxon book. Wilcoxon, oh my God. We, me and my buddies, we still will meet up on the weekend through Zoom and play exercises through Zoom on practice pads. Uh, Look at this. There it is. <laughs> the All-American drummer. And, I, uh, and 
Jeff Hamilton, who is a who's got you know chops up the yin yang, but only uses them when needed to be most musically eloquent, is just so great with that as far as just having certain books. But Will Coxton is a little bit a part of all of us, yeah. To Jeff's story when he was talking about um, uh, I can't remember who he's hanging out with, but he had him play the he goes up oh, play you know blah blah blah. So you know Jeff sits there and, and plays it like you know you normally would. And he goes, no, no, not like that. And then he plays it, you know, like as if you're on a drum set where you're splitting your hands and feet up and playing all the same rhythms, but you're putting it on a kit. Uh, hearing that story, that was fantastic. So I, I, that uh, I took that back to my buddies. I'm like, all right, we're going to have to start back page one. <laughs> all over. But we got to figure out how to put this on the kit now. That was, and even, uh, a story. And even that combination, what you're saying, you know, when you work on stick control, which I've had the the blessings to work with the family, the George Lawrence Stone descendants. George Lawrence Stone wrote the book of Stick Control in 1935. He passed away in 1967, and all of his children have since passed away. And now his grandchildren, his descendants, his at the time 13 grandchildren, were working on the book. One of them passed away, so there's 12 of them now. And I work with them in the reissue of Stick Control and Access and Rebounds. These books are still in the core of everyone's playing today. And with, with Wilcoxon book, Philly Joe Jones, the great jazz drummer, used to love playing the Wilcoxon book. And he would practice the Wilcoxon book before he went on stage. And several times when I met him, I'd go backstage to talk to him. He'd have it right there. And what was incredible about it is he'd pull it out, give me a pair of sticks on his same pad, and make us read this. Well, myself and even Virgil Donati at times was there. This is going back to the, to the late 60s, early 70s. We'd be stepping all over on ourselves, and Philly Joe would cut through that book like it was a hot knife through warm butter. So it's a it's a really good good book to go through. So you had some good beginnings, and in there are all the different rudiments. So did they make you familiar with all the PAS forty rudiments? Was, was that a part of the the learning process also? Well, of course. I mean, when you're marching drum corps, you're playing all the hybrid versions of every rudiment possible. So yeah. you know, you're familiar with the basics, but it's also like okay. Put those four together and that's called this and you're like uh okay now move it around your five drums and you know so it, it was uh you know the advanced level of, of rudimental percussion so. you know it's kind of interesting you know in the initial rudiments that were put together there were there was a a uh, there were 13 rudiments and then it was put together with nard the national association of, of rudimental drummers which had george lawrence stone in it william ludwig the first uh, Jay Burns Moore, uh, Ed Strait, all the old heavy hitters that were in there, they put together NARD. And mm -hmm. the National Association of Rudimental, then they put out a book, the NARD book, which is out there. And that had all these rudiments that were in there, what it was. And then the 13 rudiments evolved into 26 rudiments. The 26 rudiments in 1985 was then expanded to the PAS rudiments of 40 rudiments. And then this hybrid thing happened, Mark. What the heck happened with that? That's above my pay grade. I have a hard time keeping up. We have uh, a couple of guys on the Mapex marching team, uh, the BIOS guys. Uh, they, they've they created their own alphabet. Yes. Uh, it's the BIOS alphabet. And it's just, you know, it's not only just rudiments, but all the, the crazy stick tricks and everything that they're starting to do on top of playing these, all these hybrid stuff. I, I look at it now and I'm just like – I. I'm just going to stand with the video camera and record you guys because I have no business trying to play any of this stuff. Oh, these guys, and, and it's B-I-O-S, correct? B-Y-O-S. B-Y-O-S. And the BIOS, these are phenomenal technicians and rudimental specialists. Aside from what they're playing, then the movement of the sticks and the twirling on top of all of that. I saw them perform live several times and talk to them. They are fantastic players. And yes, yeah. They've taken this rudimental hybrid to a whole nother language of what they put together. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, it's, uh, it, that, that is one activity that just never slows down. They're always pushing the limit and evolving. And, uh, it's, it's as, as a former DCI, you know, member now sitting back and watching where the kids have taken it to and every year, how, you know, how much they raise the bar every year. It's just, it's fantastic. It's, it's such an incredible activity. It really, really is amazing to, to understand the, the workings of, of what the potential is in drum corps. Drum corps, and, and Mapex has a whole line of this drum corps line, which is fantastic. Just fill us in about it. I've got a Mapex snare drum here that my students love playing on. 
uh, Mapex actually has a um, brand new snare drum. It's absolutely fantastic. The, the Quantum Mark II, um, incredible snare drum, all brand new snare mechanis uh, mechanism. You can uh, quickly tune each individual gut. Um, you can remove your entire snare cartridge and everything stays in tune while you're changing bottom heads out. So if you're in a parking lot and you blow the bottom head, um, it's real quick to, to pop your snare strainers, put a new head on, put them back on, and everything's exactly in tune with the other 10 snares you guys are, you know, in the line. Yeah. We got the uh, the tenors, we got the, the classic cuts and the California cuts. So we sonically, um, we controlled the sonic characteristics of the drums by the shell makeup, the hoops, um, the profile cut. So if you're looking for a big, warm uh, tone, you know, you can go with the classics. Um, if you want something a little drier without having to tighten the heads down really high to choke the drum, you can go with the California cut, which is, um, you know, a different hoop combination, different uh, reinforcement rings, different profiles. So incredible, incredible tenors, our bass drums, the Mark II bass drums. Um, the lighter, they have uh, nice big reinforcement rings on the inside. So if you yeah. want to do a muffling on them, uh, they'll stick to it. Um, adjustable eye bolts, so it's really easy. No matter who's playing the drum in your line, um, you can position the drum exactly the way you need it. But um, the, sonically, they just project, and they project with so much tone. Whether you're doing indoor, and you know, when we had WGI finals last year, you can hear the difference between a Mark One bass drum and a Mark Two bass drum, and how much you know bigger the sound is off the Mark Twos. Uh, they just, you know, we're continually pushing, you know, the sonic limits of what our drums can do. It's just incredible. It really is amazing. And I have one of the first Mapex marching snares that were made in my studio here. And and everyone loves it. It sounds great. But I've now been attuned to the evolution of what has happened. And the brilliance behind the engineering and what's going on is just so exciting to see. And I make it a requirement to have the Mapex marching drums in my room, my teaching room here, because when we work on reading and we're working on, like we said, the Nard book or the Wilcoxon book, I put them on that snare drum. So now they go from the practice pad, learning the techniques, to now applying the techniques on that marching drum. And all the great drummers that are out there, when I talked to Russ Miller in our interview, his marching chops are fantastic. And that's kind of a part of what, what even got into the, the drum set soloing. So this marching world is a very important world to, to be involved with. Actually, a lot of the guys that I've checked for come from drumline backgrounds. And it's really funny, you know, when they're backstage warming up before a show, they're still going through their old warmups, whether it was university, whether it's drum corps or high school, they'll sit there and play their long roll exercises, uh, their flam, you know, their flam grids and, and all sorts of, you know, just all their high school drumline rudiment stuff yeah. before they go and play a rock show. <laughs> I got to bring this up here. John Harville, Bring your own style. That's what BYOS is. Bring your own style. I couldn't think of it. Thank you so much, John. And, and it just, it's just so great to have those players. I ask everyone here to go do the research. I'm, there's tons of stuff on YouTube. BYOS. These guys are so exciting and clever and creative. And then track down their language of what they added to these different – where they got like an alphabet of, of a whole different style of playing. Every letter is a combination of rudiments put together, and it's yeah. it's absolutely phenomenal. Like I said, I'll take pictures with the guys and shoot video for them, but I have no business standing. <laughs> oh, I'm, the, I, I'm with you on that, John. Thank you so much. You know, it's kind of interesting you're talking about drum teching, and we have on here Carlos Goodsman, who is just just one of these serious techs that he's out there. He texts for everyone from Max Weinberg. He's teched for Gad. He's teched for Jerry Brown. I mean, he's got so many great, great people that he's teched for. When he, Russ Miller is someone that he teched for. So he's really deep into the core of what it is. Talk about how you got involved with teching. Where did that come from? Working at Guitar Center, believe it or not. My first real experience with the drum set was at Guitar Center. Um, and that was in California? Yep, that was at the San Jose store. Um, uh -huh. I'll, I'll never forget the department manager was like, hey, Go put, you know, we just sold the drum set off the floor. Go put one together. And I was like, all right, cool. I put the bass drum together backwards. <laughs> and I did one of the rack toms upside down. And I was like, all right, I'm done. And he came over and he's like, are you kidding me? And I was like, I don't, I've never played a drum set. I've never oh, owned a drum set. I'm way over my head. Um, but I went from that to, you know, when you're doing that multiple times a day. And, you know, I was a section leader when I marched drum corps. So I was responsible for tuning all day long and making, you know, four sets of tenors sound identical. Um, so I was decent at tuning. So then I just learned how to, you know, tune the top and bottom head together. 
And, you know, when you're constantly setting up drums and working with hardware, I just got really familiar with the vast variety of things. And uh, I met a uh, famous drummer at the time. Uh, I came into the drum shop who just moved to the area. And uh, I started working with him a little bit. So I took a couple private lessons, uh, which turned into us actually being really good friends. And then he had a, a we did a clinic and I checked for him. And I, I checked for a few guys doing clinics at our store. Um, that led to a recording session and that led to a clinic tour and then another recording session. And then he called me one day and said, you're coming on tour with me. You're going to be my drum tech for pink. And I said, no, <laughs> I'm, gonna, I'm working at guitar center. I'm doing all of this. And he goes, I'm thinking, heard me. You're going to come on tour with me with pink. <laughs> and we went back and forth for a while and he finally talked me into it. And fast forward 15 years later, here we are. That is the stuff. When was that when you first started it? Um, my first actual tour was, was it 2005, 2000, 2005, 2006, right around there. And that was with Pink. Incredible. I got to show you this one here. Here's Carlos Goodsman. Don't you feel that you're a better player by just listening to these amazing drummers every night? I tell you what, I, I try to steal a little something from everybody. <laughs> just a little, you know, if I can learn one thing from each guy that I get an opportunity to sit behind, then, you know, I'm in a good, I'm in a good spot. Um, my, my favorite thing is, is everybody has a different touch to the drums. Everybody has a different technique. And as a tech, when you're there before the artist, because basically the artist walks in and plays a show and leaves, that's the environment that I try to create. So yeah. it's my job to learn how the artist hits and try to emulate the artist as best as I can. Yeah. Um, and everyone has a different touch. Uh, Ray Lazier, for instance, when I drum check for him, he likes to rim shot everything. All the toms, snare drum, everything gets hit, full volume, stick all the way across. And uh, he's that's probably one of the harder ones to tech for because you do have to hit so hard. Even like when it comes down to the 18-inch floor tom, it seems like no matter how hard I hit the thing, I can never get the gate to open as, as easily as he does it. <laughs> he also sits about the highest. I can either play his kick pedal or I can hold the hi-hat down. I can't do yeah. both when I do yeah. it for Rick. <laughs> well, talk about, talk about Ray Luzier. Ray, Ray, first of all, Ray Luzier, I have the utmost respect for. He's a phenomenal player. He's a great guy. He's got a beautiful family. I mean, he really is, he has, has put the balance together of all of it together with his playing professionalism, his educational stuff, his books that are out and stuff like his DVDs. This guy is a real serious player. What was it like traveling with Ray and, and teching for him with Korn? Um, it, absolute blast. He's a sweetheart. I love him to pieces. Um, he's one of the reasons why I, I ended up in Tennessee. We kind of both made the, the jump from California to Tennessee. Yeah. Um, absolutely love him. Fantastic human being. Uh, incredible drummer. I, I would still say I'll never forget my first gig with Ray. Um the first thing that we did was Guitar Center Sessions, and he, he wasn't playing full blast Ray. Um, the first actual show we did was Aftershock up in Sacramento, California, and I'll never forget right when we first started, his first couple of hits, I, I was immediately going, I don't have enough parts to put this thing back together. To make it <laughs> I mean, I've never seen somebody uh, attack a drum set in that manner. Um, and the crazy thing is, is even though it, as aggressive of a player he is and as, how hard he hits, there's still so much incredible technique coming off of him. Um, and everything is so tasty and, and placed and on purpose. Um, but yeah, uh, working for Ray is, is, is a lot of fun. It's a lot of changing drum heads, um, yeah. a lot of cymbals to clean. He has a lot, a lot of cymbals on that kit. Big kit. Yeah. Yeah. Huge kit, so uh, a lot of toms, a lot of a lot of changing heads on a regular basis, cleaning symbols on a regular basis, and just maintaining a lot of nuts and bolts to keep everything together night after night. So it's safe to say, from that first drum that you set up at the Guitar Center, where you had everything half-assed backwards, you now have really this is this this is baptism by fire, is what this is. So setting up these kits and putting it together, and what was it like? I mean, I mean, Ray hits hard, and listen, I, I've done festivals with Ray. He is a committed player, but you know, he plays with a technique that is so natural and he plays with this, he let, allows the stick to rebound, which is the free stroke, which he does so well. Yep. He's got his arms motion with his mo. He really has all this movement down so well. And, but yet he plays hard, but he's totally relaxed. So oh, yeah, absolutely. 
what, what is it like changing heads during a show? What, what happens when, you know, under the pressure of do heads break in the, in, in, in the process? I've literally had everything break. <laughs> I'm a piece of gear and I've had something break during a show. Um, and sometimes you have a spare, sometimes you don't. You just got to kind of, you know, use an avocado, a paper clip, and a rubber band and hope it makes it through the show. <laughs> sometimes you have a spare. Um, I, I try to, you know, two rules. Rule number one, always have a spare. Rule number two, make sure it works. <laughs> you know, going to the spare and realizing that that's broken or not tuned or not set exactly right. So, um, I, yeah, I've had literally one of my, my – favorite ones when I was working with John Blackwell with Prince, uh, we were doing rehearsals and while, while John was playing the hi-hat pull rod spun and came disconnected from the, lower yeah, assembly, yeah, yeah. the clutch is holding it on. Then he's playing and he hit the clutch just right that the wing nut holding the clutch on spin spun all the way off. The pull rod dropped all the way down to the bottom and both cymbals hit the stage. <laughs> it was in rehearsal but, you know, Prince stopped the song, and I walk up there, and I'm looking at John. I'm like, what'd you do? And he's looking at me like, I have no idea what's going on. And it took us a few minutes to, like, work it all out and find all the missing pieces. Um, but every time I have one of those random freak things break on me, it changes the way that I tech moving forward. So, you know, whether it's all, I always use Loctite, so that piece never comes loose ever yeah, again. Yeah, yeah. When yeah. I put on high eye clutches, I always uh, make it so if they hit it, they tighten it, they won't loosen it. Yeah. Oh, just little things like that. I've had bass drum heads break on me during the shows. Uh, Mark Schulman actually broke a kick drum head when I was working with him uh, on Share in Las Vegas. And uh, thankfully, I actually had another bass drum because that show, there was video and this, the drum riser, the band were on risers that drove like 60 feet out onto the stage and 20 feet off stage. Yeah. Everything was automated. So uh, we actually ended up swapping kick drums in the middle of the show. Was that the was that the last tour that Cher did in Vegas, or was it the, a couple of years ago? When was that? Um, I want to say around two thousand, like ten through twelve, somewhere in there when she yeah, had a yeah. because I, I saw that show and, and, and that setup. I, I've known Mark for many many years. First of all, it's amazing how great Mark is. Mark is a consummate pro in how he plays, and Mark's the kind of guy where he can break whatever breaks apart. You'll never know it. He just oh, keeps yeah. going through as if everything is fine, smiling, playing the part until whatever has to be fixed is fixed. <laughs> it was funny. He, he called me. We had a – because the, the riser was always moving, I couldn't sit behind him. And normally I'm sitting either you know, right behind him or next to the artist. Yeah. So I'm right there. Most of the times I try to anticipate what they're going to ask for. So if I notice something's moving or if I see that their body language – is hitting things differently. It's like, okay, is it in a different spot? Are they hurt? Yes. You know, what, yes. What's going on? And try to pick things apart and anticipate um, whether it's the mix or something on the kit. Yeah. And um, uh, for this particular gig, I had cameras on the kit and I was sitting behind a big video wall and he calls me out and he goes, hey, come here, the bass drum pedal feels weird. And so I come out there and look and sure enough, there's a crack right through the drum head and it was a two by <laughs> head. And so I quickly threw some tape on it and I just remember it's telling Mark, I'm like, Mark, whatever you do, don't break the second ply. I'll be right back. I'll meet you over here. We're going to swap kick drums. Just please <laughs> don't break the drum head. And I tell you what, you couldn't even tell that anything was wrong on that riser. Yeah, he's such a performer, um, such a professional. I mean, he just played right through it. No problems. It's pretty amazing when you think about it. And you mentioned John Blackwell, another phenomenal player. John was a student of mine for several years, and uh, I met him in South Carolina, which is where he was from. And uh, just a beautiful person. His dad was also a drummer, so I got to meet his dad. And, and he used to come as a as a 12-year-old child to all of my events whenever I was in the South Carolina, North Carolina, Atlanta area. He and his dad would drive to every one of my clinics. And what a beautiful soul. What a phenomenal player. And he really played. I mean, you had, you had symbols behind him. He really played in every area. So to get to that kit... I mean, you, 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 Simon Bajari mentioned about, you know, MacGyver methods. This is like whatever it takes, you got to figure out how to make this thing happen. That's yep. how, and, and again, you bless his soul. You know, John was just another wonderful, wonderful artist. Such an honor to, um, to, to work with John. It was um, incredible. I mean, 
that entire band um, that Prince had working for him, and it was absolutely just incredible to watch and be a part of those shows. Yeah. Um, John was uh, a wealth of knowledge. That guy knew everybody's part on every song, the tempos, how it was played, who's supposed to be doing what part. I mean, that guy, uh, absolutely brilliant, absolutely brilliant, and ph phenomenal drummer. It was just such an honor to, to, to work with John. And he, he left us too soon. He really did. And, and I was uh, I was apart with his wife to go and uh, spread his ashes uh, in Florida. And it was just a beautiful ceremony. And uh, just just great that you've had these experiences. Talk about Barry Kirch. This guy is I love Barry's playing. Shine down. Barry and Barry took some lessons with me. We talked about loosening him up with some technique. Barry is a is an is an energy on his own that just gets behind the kid. And it is in your face, full force, nonstop. What a fantastic player and a great guy. Talk about Barry. Barry is another one of those drumline guys. Uh, he was a snare drummer. He was a tenor drummer. Um, he marched through college. And he and I would practice on a regular basis. He actually, we had a couple pair of your sticks and um, practice pads. We'd work out at Wilcoxon. Or I'd ha have some of my music from when I marched drum corps nice. um, out on the road with us. And so... We would spend, we put put aside some time and work on our hands on a regular basis. Nice. Um, his warm up routine was, you know, everything from you know flam grids through long roll exercises, um, and you know his 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 hands are absolutely beautiful. Um, yeah. and when he goes and switches to a drum set, he's another one that from the first note to the last note, it's one hundred percent all the way through. Um, incredible technique. Big, massive drum sound by the way he hits the drums. Oh, absolutely. Uh, but nothing's ever forced. It's Everything's really natural uh, when you watch him play. I mean, he's it's using a lot of energy, um, but there's nothing. Uh, he pulls so much tone out of the drums mm -hmm. even when he's hitting that hard. Um, but those shows are, are absolutely phenomenal. I mean, that that is a full, full production, um, and he's one heck of a drummer. He's absolutely incredible. Well, this, this teching, I mean, just, just listen, sitting backstage and listening to these drummers every show, as Carlos said, it's got to just bring ideas to you. It's got experience. I mean, that's why it has been so great that you evolved to KHS S at Mapex. This real, you are exactly the right person to have for where we are right now with the company, which is so beautiful. So talk about now the transition from, from going from that teching into your Mapex position. Um. I had a little girl. Um, she's to be turning three in November. Beautiful. It just got to a point where uh, I didn't want to raise her through FaceTime. I wanted to be with her every single day and be with my family every day. So I started looking for opportunities here in Nashville. And an uh, opportunity popped up to come work with Mapex, um, work with Jeff Mulvihill and be the assistant brand manager for Mapex. Yeah. So uh, I made the transition to you know, driving to work every day as opposed to being on a tour bus. Yeah, oh, but listen, Jeff Mulvihill at Mapex is, first, he's a phenomenal drummer. He's oh, yeah. extremely brilliant at knowing the craft and the product so well. So the fact that you get to work with him is the joy right there. So talk about now, the, about the product now. And we have even like uh, Keith Dudek, greetings, Mapex friends. This is another phenomenal, phenomenal player and educator for sure yes. in, what, in what Keith does. Thank you, Keith, for joining us. Um, so, you know, the evolution of the product where we're at right now, um, we just launched a bunch of new snare drums. Um, we've got 14 new Black Panther, uh, snare drums that are actually out and available now. Um, we got a bunch of our artists that are putting together a really cool video project that's going to be coming out real soon. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we've got some absolutely incredible, incredible snares. Um, Russ Miller was, you know, Russ was kind of the the driving force behind, you know, the development of each individual snare. And the cool thing about it is, um, as opposed to having, you know, a steel drum and this step, this step, this step, and, and, you know, a maple one and all the sizes, what we've done is actually approached the snare drum from a, a sonic position where we're building a drum for a sonic characteristic. Nice. So we basically cover the entire um, need for snare drum, like w w whether you need something thin and bright or deep, dark, warm, um, dry, like there's a snare drum for every sound. Right. Uh, there's a whole flow chart that goes to, to the development of the snare drum, which is really incredible. And we came up with some absolutely beautiful snare drums. 
Uh, there's some new lug designs that we came out with. Um, um, beautiful, beautiful finishes. We've got some incredible new metal snare drums to the lineup. There's a beautiful aluminum snare drum, a new copper snare drum. Um, that's one of my personal favorites. You'll see Richie Martinez on his videos. Yeah. He's been doing it quite extensively. It's an absolute beautiful drum. Um, who is it? Um, Rashid just did some videos um, using... Who I interviewed you here. We'll talk about all the interviews I've done later on, but Rashid's a phenomenal player. He's playing, what, which drum is he playing? Which snare drum? I want to say he's using the Nucleus. He just put out some videos using that yeah. drum. They just, every single drum sounds incredible, but they all sound very different from one another. So it's yeah. a really palette of, of drums to choose from. So that's that's something fantastic that we have going right now. Um, we have a new Saturn kit. Well, that, before, before we go into the drum sets, let's go back to the snare drums for a second, because I saw these snare drums at NAM. Oh yeah. Each drum had its own personality. Oh yeah, absolutely. And they were all set up kind of you know in, in, in rows to here. And when I went down and played them, I, Mario, I was really amazed at the uniqueness and the difference from the different types of woods that we use, the wood drums, then to the different metal drums. You mentioned copper, you mentioned aluminum. These are all qualities that are going to change that sonic sound. Yes. And it really was. And they're all available now. I, I tell you what, as, as a tech and a player, my favorite thing about the snare drums is the control you have of the drum. You know, sometimes Sorry. you'll get on a metal snare drum and... If you're not hitting it absolute perfect dead center or wherever that sweet spot is, um, yeah. the drum has a tendency to run away from you. These new drums, no matter how you're playing it, where on the head you're playing it, the drum is always in control. Uh, yeah. It really lets you play the drum. The drum's not forcing you to play it, uh, right. if that makes any sort of sense. I'm, I'm sure you've yeah, been on yeah. drums where they just, that happens. But um, the, these drums are just, they're so much fun even just to sit there with just a snare drum by itself, no kit, just to, to sit there and play. Yeah, um, yeah. They sound incredible. They feel incredible. Um, it's very inspiring to just to, to just sit back and just go and not have to worry and think about anything and just let the drum talk. Well, it, it, they really, I, I ask everyone to go do the research. You know, uh, I mean, my gosh, there's so many, look at this here. Here's, here's, I got to put this up here. This is, Lonnie Cravens, I brought my Mapex Mars Pro kit in 1997, more than 2,000 shows, and it still has a great sound. It's still holding up. Fantastic, Lonnie. Thanks for sharing that. That is so great. Um, Carlos, who knows Jeff, says Jeff rocks. Jeff Mobile. Jeff is a serious, serious player and artist involved with Mapex, which is a great help. Absolutely. I mean, he's a... Uh, uh, Fantastic kit player, but he's the one who actually paid attention and did all the orchestral stuff that I didn't do. Um, he's <laughs> a player, incredible timpani player. Yeah, yeah. Uh, his concert chops are are fantastic. Uh, I I don't even pretend to to contribute or know when it comes to that sort of thing. He's <laughs> in his territory. Let's talk. Um, about, let's talk about drum sets now. Okay, so I've got in my studio behind me. The, um, the, the This kit here is my student's kit. That's a Saturn IV. Okay. This back here is a Saturn V that I have here, if you can kind of see. Yep. And, and listen, these kits, and actually that Saturn V was the drum kit that we had used. We did a memorial for Joe Hibbs. And to mention Joe Hibbs, this was a soul that was just so deep in the Mapex family of what he did for bringing artists aboard designing product. Joe was a brilliant, brilliant mind. We lost him a couple of years ago and uh, and it's, it's been, uh, you know, uh, always a, a sorely missed person in the drumming community. But we had done a memorial for him in Nashville at B.B. King's place. And we had all these artists come by. Kirk Covington was there. Russ Miller was the MD for the event. We put together a band. We all played the tunes. I played. We had so many artists that came down and played. It was so exciting all for Joe, and that was the kit. This kit back here was a kit that they used for the artists. When it was done, I think it was Jeff too. They said, Jeff, you know, we, we still haven't sent you your drum set yet because of all the craziness with Joe passing him away. I said, great, send me what you got. He said, well, we'll get you a new kit from the factory. I said, well, you know, Jeff, like three of us, I'd like this kit, knowing that it was used for Joe's memorial and all these great drummers played on it. He said, you want this one? It's kind of beaten up. I said, no, just the heads are a little destroyed. I'm going to change the heads. Send me that kit. So that's what he sent down for me, which is so beautiful. But I had the chance recently, in the early part of the year, after NAM, to play at Drumio and used one of the new 
kits. So just talk about the kits now that are out now in the Saturn series. So um, we have now the Saturn kit. It's just called Saturn, not Saturn four, five, or six. Saturn. Yeah. Um, it is basically the Saturn V evolved. Yeah. Uh, we've uh, put some upgrades to it. Uh, we've upgraded the floor tom legs. There, it's a feature from the design lab, yeah. um, which, was Russ the, Miller's, which was Russ Miller's engineering on these legs the way they are. So it allows the drum to sit better yep. and allow more resonance. Listen, the tone quality on those legs is incredible. That's nice that they were added to that. It makes a big difference. So yeah. uh, we've upgraded the floor tom legs. Um, we've upgraded like the air hole positions. Um, to work uh to let the drum breathe and, and resonate a little bit more naturally it's yeah. still the same shell uh makeup where it's uh still the maple um with the interior ply of a uh, walnut so that's all still the same um we've just upgraded a few things it's a uh, chrome hardware now uh we have four beautiful finishes um if you saw al cleveland who was just on here a few weeks ago yes. he had the black kit and then um, if you, uh, Richie has the uh, the Teal Blue Fade kit. Yeah. Um, if you watch tomorrow night on America's Got Talent, um, you'll see the flat white kit is gonna be, um, one of the performers is gonna be using that kit. Oh, is that fantastic. So that uh, kit, that's kit, it's just called Saturn. Saturn, yep. And it's, it's the maple shell with the walnut interior, which to me is, and, and part of that design, many years ago when I had joined the company, I wanted a very thin shell. Yeah. I wanted. I kept saying, guys, thin shell. To me, that is what's going to that 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 lets the drum breathe, and so maple alone would not give the strength for the shell to be that thin. But having that walnut interior allows it to be strong with the maple sound, and that to me is the magic of what Mapex was able to do, which was just incredible. You can really hear the 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 contribution of the wood to the sound. You know when yeah. you get thicker drums um you're hearing more of the drum head um yeah. and the sound because it's so thick on the uh, the shells are so thick you're transferring more energy up and down right uh, with the thinner shells the energy is moving into into the shell itself and and you're hearing more of the characteristic of the wood uh coloring your drum head selection um right. and, and contributing to the sound it's and and you're right those shells are very thin and you do get an incredible sound from them it, it really is Richie really? uh, had his recording session for his new band, and he had nothing but incredible things to say from the audio engineer. Same thing with Al Cleveland. He's been doing some recording sessions on the new ones, and uh, all the reports back from audio engineers um, is how great these kits sound. Um, Richie also used another kit for a, um, a cymbal video recently, and same thing. It was supposed to be cymbal-based, but you know, the engineers were talking about the drum sound is incredible. Yeah, it really is amazing to witness. And I, and I asked everyone to go back and check out the sound of these drums. Now, talk about the kit that I played at Drumio that was sent me that had Birch. Um, the Drumio kit, that's a Saturn Evolution kit. Um, that's that's the next step. That's a uh, whole new shell design, um, different mixtures of woods, um, and a whole new mounting system, a uh, whole new suspension mount, the halo mount. Um, yeah. Incredible drums, incredible drums. Uh, we'll be seeing those um, hit the streets this January. Um, and that's, that's birch and walnut. Yes, but what what what, um, what we did was change the placement of the walnut ply. Um, where the Saturn kit, the walnut is the interior ply. Now it's actually sandwiched between maple or birch. Uh, we have two different shell designs. Yeah. Uh, so. Um, the walnut ply is the actual part of the bearing edge that's actually making contact with the head. So mm -hmm. we're transferring energy through that walnut ply into the rest of the shell, which is really cool. And it really makes for an incredible sound. If uh, anybody was at the NAMM show and you had an opportunity to walk by and hear someone hitting the kick drums or the toms up on the display, you had an opportunity. <laughs> it is a, a distinct difference. It is an uh, incredible, incredible sound. And the quality of birch, which I also love, is just is just this deeper deeper sound and it just it just allows a lot of the lower vibrations to really kind of be projected it sounded fantastic and that set that i heard at nam i was flying from the nam show which is this big again if they don't know this huge convention in california that happens every year for the past 60 years i've been to 42 of them my myself i've never missed one and that set was shipped to drumeo which was in vancouver for my performance at drumeo 
that I had done for a series of lessons for them. And that kit went in there. We set it up. It was intense with the setup. And the first thing the engineer said was, this was the easiest jump that I had to set up. And Mike, it sounds great. It was simple, easy, and we were off and running. It was amazing. Absolutely. And, and Birch does have a really um, unique sound to it. Um, you know, the Mars kits are all Birch. Yeah. Um, and we recently just did a, a video for, um, I want to say it was Sweetwater Gear Fest. And we took two kits, same exact size. I think it was an 18-inch kick, uh, rack on the floor. And we tuned up all factory heads for the video. We tuned one kit really high, yeah. real jazzy. And then I took the other one and tuned it really low and kind of made it a big rock sound. And it was um, – it's amazing with our bearing edges that we have on our drums and with, you know, the birch wood specifically, how quick the drums react, yeah. how that note translates, um, um, and and the broad tuning range that you can achieve with the combination of, of you know, the bearing edge is a real big one, um, but with, you know, those birch kits, those Mars kits, um, all the way up to the rest of the line, everything has got such a big tuning range. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Big, response but the, the, that birch just is such a fast fast tom um really good reaction dynamic levels that uh, we had rashid and drika watson in the building to make some videos on those new finishes uh, on the mars kits and they all said the same thing it's just like it's it, the tone is right there yeah totally totally you know, clear. Yeah, it's incredible here is a uh, simon bajaring i brought my mapex saturn pros from denmark to the states he purchased them in denmark brought to the states and they've been with him since 2006. These drums are just incredibly fantastic. And here's Frank Perry, who's a dear friend of mine, who is a phenomenal player. He's in, in, into this whole ambidexterity, you know, kind of a kit where he plays righty and lefty. He's got this whole Mapex setup. It's so incredible. And Frank says, I can't wait to get the Saturn Evolution kit. So they're all waiting for it too for next year for that to come out. And here's Ian Hunter. I believe, and just in case, Three Falcon bass drum pedals, the machete, the heartbreaker, seven Falcon boomers, Falcon hi hat, two Saturn V natural burl, the Saturn V deep water burl, just the best. These these are fans that are so dedicated to the kits and what they are. This is incredible to experience the journey of what the sound of the drums are and this new series that's coming out. We're all excited to hear it for sure. Oh, I mean, we're all very excited too. I mean, the, the product is is beautiful. It sounds incredible. Um, the technology that we're putting into the drums, you know, from the bearing edges all the way to the mounting systems, um, and they're just, they're incredible drums. They all sound phenomenal. I mean, the design labs, uh, the Versatis and the Cherry Bombs, oh. um, the, the the shell design is is one thing. And then when you look at the hardware um, and what the hardware uh, adds to the drums, you know, the, the mats mount, uh, the uh, adjustable floor tom leg, um, all of that just... I wish as a drum tech, when I was teching, that I had yeah. that sort of technology on some of the drums. Because that's all, you know, either your floor tom doesn't have enough sustain, it doesn't sound like your back toms, right, right. or your floor tom has way too much sustain, and now you got to calm it down. Yeah. Uh, you know, the, the, the Design Lab stuff gives you the ability to control all of that, which is really phenomenal. Um, and you can also mix and match, and that's a feature that we brought down to the evolution. With Design Lab, you can... Uh, take a, a, a Versatis kick drum and, and add on cherry bomb toms, you know, depending on what mixer that you're looking for, what you prefer, which is really yeah. cool. So we took yeah. that to the evolution line where you can do, you know, maple kick drums and birch toms or however you would like to put your own kit together, which is really, really neat. Russ Miller is a, is a brilliant mind in, in, the, in the mechanical design of, of, of understanding sound and sonic degrees and put together this drum set on behalf of the great engineers over at Mapex, it is a beautiful kit. When I had Russ on and we talked about it, it really is beautiful. And joining us just recently now is Jeff Hamilton, just able to check in. Jeff, who I had a chance of interviewing Jeff. First of all, what a fantastic player. What a brilliant mind as far as the experience that he has going back with playing with just really legends in the industry, which has made him a legend in the industry. And his drums sound freaking great. <laughs> it's, it's really, that, that interview with Jeff went way too quick. We're going to have to get him back on for a round two because that was a fantastic interview. Yeah, he definitely needs a part two for sure, Jeff. Thanks so much for joining us up. Before we go out here, I want you just to go down the list of the artists that we've had, that we've had on this Mapex Live Monday, 2 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. Everyone that's on here, we started out with Russ Miller. 
Yeah, uh, we had Rush Miller. We had uh, Rashid. Rashid was in the house. Phenomenal drummer, yes. Absolutely phenomenal drummer. Um, uh, let's see. We had uh, Steve Fittick was on. We had Ralph Peterson. Yes. Uh, Jeff Hamilton. We had Vera from uh, South America. Vera Figueroa from South America. She was phenomenal. And she's doing all these great TV shows. Another great dedicated Mapex artist and phenomenal player. Yep. Um, Daryl Robinson, uh, incredible drummer, musical director. Um, oh, yeah. Phenomenal, phenomenal. Uh, Achilles, uh, Achilles Priester, who we had on this. On this. Again, uh, that guy does not stop putting out content. Um, yeah. That guy is just a, a workhorse. Um, great studio setup, and that kid is huge. Um, we had Al Cleveland, Al Cleveland the third. Oh, was great. Another good drum corps guy, yeah. Um, did you happen to catch his uh, video that he did with uh, Sean playing tenors and he was playing drum set? I did see that and I checked. Everyone should go and check that out. It was incredible. Stay tuned because there's going to be a lot more of that coming from Al and from Sean. Oh, They're going to be a really yeah. cool video series all on Mapex drums, marching, and drum set. Yeah. We're going to yeah. uh, introduce drum set to the marching kids and help them do that transition and help expose our drum set guys to the marching world and, and help cross that over. So it's really yeah. cool stuff. Working what, on it. Who, are we missing anybody that we have on here? Uh, let's see, Sean Fuller, Alex Bailey, Richie Martinez. Yeah, uh, we got some cool people coming up as well. Um, we were supposed to have Kirk today, but Kirk's in a session, last minute session, so I'm filling in for him. But uh, next week, stay tuned for Richie Bravo. Richie Bravo, who I had the chance to interview for the sessions panel. So I ask you all go to the sessions panel on YouTube, watch the Richie Bravo interview, and then be prepared here to get him on it too, which Carlos Guzman works very, very well with Richie doing all the Miami dates that they do. Richie is out, you know, I mean, my gosh, the Barry Gibb tour. I mean, these guys are doing so much. And still, even with this COVID, these guys are busier than ever in their studios. So there is a, a whole phenomenal energy. And we're going to get Hamilton back for a part two. We're going to squeeze him out. We're going to get him in his barn. <laughs> he says he's a busy man, but I think we can pull it off. We Much are going to squeeze him in the schedule. If we've got to get him in between dinner, and he loves eating chicken, he, we have a chicken story. So maybe before or after his chicken meal, I'm going to get him to do another talk of what we have here to do. <laughs> fantastic. Fantastic. Well, this is fantastic. Mark, thank you so much for filling in for Kirk. Kirk is like calling Captain Kirk, man. Come on. We're going to get him on here. We'll get him back in here for sure. Thank you so much for filling him in. You have been fantastic. Last minute to happen. In. You are extremely informative of what you've shared. So I thank you so much on behalf of Mapex to have you here, to squeeze it out. Get back to work. We're going to hit it now. Thank you so much. Everyone that has listened in, thank you all so, so much. Mark, thank you again. And thank we'll you talk to you real soon. All right, guys? Thanks so much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.